coming up on the best indie games of October. An RPG set in colonial India, a roguelike about blobs with detachable heads, and the most insane rhythm game you've ever seen. But first, let's get some news and honourable mentions. PAX Australia 2016 ran from November 4 to 6. There were more than 70 indie games on the showroom floor, including the recently announced Frame 2 and Mini Metro, which recently released on iOS and Android. We made a snapshot video of our favourite indie games at the convention, which you can watch now. Butcher is a rapid, almost bullet hell shooter in which you're always surrounded by enemies who immediately lock onto you. The game is best when it incorporates the environment. Dress Code Human is a silly Halloween themed dress up in which you plop skin, hair and eyes onto a skeleton for some hilarious results. Exit is a short adventure game made for Game Boy Jam 5, which demonstrates the excellent potential of Game Boy themed graphics. Also made as part of the Game Boy Jam, Legend of Ball is a dungeon crawler in which you throw a ball to destroy enemies and hit switches to open paths. In Manual Samuel, pampered rich boy Samuel dies and makes a deal with the devil. Survive one day controlling his crippled body manually. As you'd imagine, the results are hilarious. Party Golf is a chaotic race to the hole in procedurally generated levels for up to four players. For now, it is limited to local play only. Shenzhen IO is an early access game from Zaktronics, creator of Infiniminer and Infinifactory. In it, you build circuits and program code. If you do play it, make sure you read the manual. Through the Woods is a slow starting horror game set in a rather dark Norwegian forest. The gameplay and voice acting is average, but the chills, story and visuals are all fantastic. That's all our honourable mentions, so now let's get into the top 5. Swiftly, the light gathered itself together, painted for an instant the faces and the cartwheels and the bullock's horns as red as blood. Then the night fell. Kim is an RPG set in Rudyard Kipling's 1901 novel of the same name. You play as Kim, a 15-year-old Irish orphan, who has blended into colonial India so well that he's often mistaken for a native. The great adventures that Kim goes on during the book are repackaged as in-game missions. You can go on a spiritual journey with a Tibetan Lama, spy on the Russians as part of the British Secret Service, and much more. Player choices in and around these missions allow you to establish a unique identity. You can become a Muslim, Hindu, or Catholic, and you can choose to be a beggar or a thief. Another key part of the game is travelling through the cities and rural areas of the subcontinent, giving the game a road trip feel. The drawback to travelling is that it will drain health, fatigue, happiness, and hunger. Survival is a struggle and the poverty of the times is well felt. The top down view won't give you a physical sense of India, but it makes level navigation easier. Some of the lingo that characters speak is hard to understand, but learning it is part of the fun and immerses you in the world. When you reach the age of 18, the game stops and you can restart from the beginning. We think it's worth a replay or two, but probably no more than that. Kim is great, and we'd love to see more novels adapted into games. RPGs are obviously a natural choice, and it worked well for Kim, but it'd be interesting to see how books can be adapted into other genres. Aragami first surfaced to the public back when we started this channel and so we've keenly followed its journey for over two years. Initially the uni project of three Barcelona students, Aragami was put onto Kickstarter in the middle of 2014. Back then the game was called Twin Souls The Path of Shadows and it immediately caught our attention as this Japanese Assassin's Creed by Moonlight. However, it failed to reach its funding goal. The setback delayed the development timeline but as the developers noted in a self-written post-mortem, it forced them to reflect on their game. Two years later, the result is the release of a more sophisticated and overall fantastic stealth game. The world is more colourful, providing greater contrast to the darkness. The reworked K-1 
character design of the protagonist makes him feel more human and makes you more invested in the story. The original game design remains and is still effective. Controlling the shadows, you can teleport between shadows like in Dishonored, become invisible, use shadows as projectile weapons and even summon a shadow dragon to fight for you. These mechanics are simple but provide you with creative ways to get past or take down your enemies. An underrated feature of Aragami is its co-op mode. Playable both online and locally, it lets you push Aragami's mechanics to new heights and cause absolute chaos. All up, Aragami is a stylish 6-7 hour adventure that has something for both stealth and action fans. Ghana is a hellish platformer with roguelike elements, a description we've heard many times. The roguelike is a crowded genre, especially in the indie scene, and whilst Ghana is comparable to Spelunky and the Binding of Isaac, it feels different, and that's why we like it. It starts with the aesthetics, the rainbow colours popping off the black backdrop. Then there's the blobby characters, and your best friend Sally the Beached Whale, who shows up to give you extra health. But it's not just stylistic choices that make Ghana distinct. The very movement, the way you bounce off enemies and walls is unique. Going deeper, there's a complex combo system that wouldn't be out of place in a Bayonetta game. Not to mention the item system. There's three items, guns, backpacks and heads. Guns are self-explanatory. Backpacks are cooldown abilities and heads are a little bit trickier. They determine how much health you have alter how you move, and give you special powers like aiming upwards. Heads can be knocked off your blob, and in this headless state you become a one-hit kill. The best thing about the guns, backpacks and heads is that you only need to discover them once. After that, you can choose whatever combination of the three you want at the start of every run. We'd also like to give a shout out to the music, which is not only brilliant, but paces the game, such as speeding up as you chain combos. Ghana is another roguelike platformer, but with its own fresh ideas. <laughs> Orwell is a game of counter-terrorism. Bombs are being planted in public spaces, and you need to stop it happening. Not through force, but by identifying the perpetrator. This is done by spying on civilians from behind a computer screen, and this is what Orwell is really about. On behalf of the ambiguously titled The Nation, you were given access to a program called Orwell. Like how Frankenstein became synonymous with the monster, here George Orwell is confused with his monster, Big Brother. Whilst the surveillance of George Orwell's Big Brother was government-monitored telescreens, the surveillance techniques in the game come in many forms. You can listen in on phone calls, hack emails, and watch CCTV footage. But there's also ample information that's not just available to you as a government agent, but the rest of the public. Searching through the web, social media posts, dating site profiles, and blogs offer clues that will get your investigation rolling. For us, this was a harrowing reminder that almost all of us unwittingly provide enough information online for someone to watch us undetected. As the spy, you'll be constantly conflicted between respecting people's privacy and maintaining security. Saving lives is the bigger picture option that we often took, but it doesn't make the voyeuristic examination of someone's life any less uncomfortable. This is made worse if you make a mistake, as your choices have huge consequences. The contract you sign at the start of the game says you'll quote, judge objectively in the best of my belief, teasing the predicaments that await you. Orwell is being released as a 5 episode series. The first episode is available as a free demo, and episode 5 will come out on November 17. On paper, Thumper doesn't seem like anything radically new, but playing it feels like nothing else. 
The game describes itself as rhythm violence. The rhythm part is noticeable straight away. Having to hit a button as you pass over glowing pads, it seems like your metallic bug is traveling down the neck of a guitar in Rock Band. The same time-based principles apply to other actions like turning corners and breaking through barriers. Some levels have bosses, and hitting certain pads will blast lasers at the face of enemies that sit at the end of the rail. There are no checkpoints, but your silver exoskeleton serves as an extra life that can easily be recuperated in the early levels. Like any rhythm game, performing the correct sequence is the aim. Hitting the pads makes a particularly satisfying thump to the beat, from where the game gets its name. But what sets Thumper apart is its music-driven atmosphere. The ominous beat of the drums, mixed with the roaring synths and deceptively calm horns, makes for a terrifically creepy yet riveting soundtrack. The psychedelic visuals are trippy, but it's the sprawling tentacles and screaming faces of enemies that stand out. Thumper is horrific and uncomfortable. It channels the Matrix and fills you with existential dread. It sounds kind of awful, but it's such a potent and intense experience that you can't stop playing. Thumper is available for 20 US dollars and has just been updated with a new game plus mode. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time here on Indie Former.